everyone. Thanks for joining us today. We'll get started in just a few seconds here. We're just going to allow for people to keep entering in. Let's go ahead and jump in. So good morning to everyone. I'm Molly McGurr, the Events and Programs Manager for Traverse Connect. We're so happy to have you all here with us today. And I definitely wanna make sure that you have the opportunity to ask any and all questions that you might have or any comments. So how you're able to do that is we have a Q&A button located at the bottom of your screen, as well as a chat box. So you can use both the Q&A or the chat um, at any point during the presentation to put, enter your questions in there or your comments. And at the very end of the presentation, that's when we'll be opening up that Q&A. So we'll make sure we get to each and every one of them. If there's something that we're not able to answer, we will follow up with you at a later date. So on that note, I would now like to turn it over to Christy Seeloff. Christy, thanks for being here with us today. Thanks, Molly. Hi everyone, my name is Kirsty Seeloff and I am the Director of Government Relations for the Northern Michigan Chamber Alliance and also Travers Connect. On behalf of the Northern Michigan Chamber Alliance, welcome to Michigan's Judiciary AC after COVID-19. We're honored today to welcome Chief Justice Bridget Mary McCormick. The Northern Michigan Chamber Alliance is a coalition of chambers and economic development organizations from Alpena, Benzie, Boyne, Cadillac, Charlevoix, Sheboygan, East Jordan, Elk Rapids, Gaylord, Harbor Springs, Leelanau, Manistee, Marquette, Petoskey, Sioux area, and Traverse City. We exist to advocate for rural Northern Michigan and move forward rural-centric business policy. Before we get started, I'd like to tell you a little bit about our speaker today. Chief Justice Bridget Mary McCormick joined the Michigan Supreme Court in January of 2013 and became the Chief Justice in January of 2019. An NYU law graduate, Chief Justice McCormick started her legal career in New York City. In 1996, she joined the, the Yale Law School faculty. She then joined the University of Michigan Law School faculty in 1998, where she taught criminal law, legal ethics, and various clinics. She was also named Associate Dean for Clinical Affairs in 2002. Chief Justice McCormick was elected to the American Law Institute in 2013 the U.S. Department of Justice and the U.S. Department of Commerce's National Institute of Standards and Technology appointed her to the National Commission on Forensic Science in 2014. She serves as an editor on the ABA's preeminent journal, Litigation. In 2019, Governor Whitmer appointed her as co-chair of the Michigan Joint Task Force on Jail and Pretrial Incarceration. And in 2020, she was appointed as, as board member of the Kids Kicking Cancer nonprofit organization. Chief Justice McCormick continues to teach at the University of Michigan each year, as well as publish in professional journals and law media. Chief Justice McCormick is married to Stephen Crowley, a partner at Latham and Watkins, and they also have four children. Welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you for that introduction. And thank you all for the invitation to um, talk to you today about um, the courts in Michigan, how they've been affected by COVID-19 and what life looks like in the state courts um, after COVID-19. I wanna say that I'm jealous of each and every one of you for the part of Michigan you live in. It is absolutely uh, my favorite part. And um, my husband and I are looking forward to um, our summer vacation in your, uh, in your counties uh, where we love to bike. It's our favorite place in the state. Um, so thanks again. Um, let's move on to the next slide, please. So what I'm gonna to cover today is um, a little bit of just background on um, your state courts and how many of them there are, what the public thinks about them, um, the role of the Michigan Supreme Court um, with respect to all of the other courts of the state, the response um, to the COVID-19 crisis in the courts across the state, and then the lessons we're learning. I don't know, I put lessons learned, but I should have said the lessons we're learning. Um, and then I hope to answer any questions you have. I, 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 my presentation part of this will, will not be um, too long because I um, am eager to actually talk about what you care about. Um, so I'm hoping that my presentation gives you some 
insight um, that is useful, but then I'm happy to talk about anything else that, um, that interests you. Slide, please. The National Center for State Courts um, tracks public confidence in, um, in their state courts. Every year they do an extensive public survey of people around the country. Um, and the state courts uh, over and over again get pretty high marks. Um, people have a great deal of confidence in this branch of government. We'd like to keep it that way. Um, and it sort of um, is, it, 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 it doesn't kind of rise and fall with the state of the economy like sometimes the other branches of government's confidence level does. Um, it is uh, consistently um, pretty good. Uh, that doesn't mean we shouldn't work to make it better. We should always, um, but it's cons just consistently pretty good. Before I move on to the next slide, I want to say for a minute, um, when I say state courts, of course, there are federal courts and state courts in Michigan, um, but the great majority of legal disputes are adjudicated in state courts. In fact, 95% of criminal cases and 95% of civil cases, roughly, are adjudicated in state courts. Um, that's true not just in Michigan, but across the nation. Slide, please. Uh, the National Center also asks uh, uh, folks every year in their survey what it is they care about um, in their state courts, and their answers are also uh, remarkably consistent. Um, people on both sides of the partisan aisle want independent courts. They, they want what our founders designed. They want a court that is uh, free from political pressure, makes decisions that are transparent, and accountable and based only on the law. Um, so they understand that sometimes their, 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 the, the position they want will win and sometimes it won't. Uh, that a court's job is not to um, deliver results for a particular group of people, it's to deliver on the law. They want courts that are accessible and they worry wor a little more about this each year. Um, and this is something I often get a lot of questions about and we've spent a lot of time working on and I'm happy to talk about it in Q&A. Um, people are worried about not being able to afford lawyers and the cost of adjudicating disputes in courts is a concern that is on um, folks' minds. Um, so it's something to be mindful. Um, they want to know that their judges are engaged in and responsive to the problems and concerns of their local communities. They, what, you know, while, while they understand that a judge's job is not to deliver partisan results, they want to know that their judges understand what it is that's going on in their in their communities. They don't want them to be removed from the real problems that people are facing in their communities. And finally, they they do worry some about the efficiency of getting business done in courts. Um, they 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 want to know that um, not only are courts using public resources in the most cost efficient way possible, but that they themselves don't have to lose significant time um, from work and uh, um, more expense than they would to resolve a dispute another way. So those are the key themes that we try and keep in mind at the Michigan Supreme Court when we um, focus on our administrative um, work. Slide, please. Um, the Michigan Supreme Court has, has uh, a primary function of decision-making. I shouldn't say that. Two, we have two functions. One is decision-making. I think everyone is familiar with that. That's where we make decisions on the, the cases that um, reach our court. Um, you will see that in the photo on uh, the left, this is the court hearing arguments by Zoom on May 6th, just last week. Uh, we've now heard arguments by Zoom three times, um, twice in April and once last week. Um, it's worked surprisingly well. I feel like the work that appellate courts do translates, the decision-making work that appellate courts do translates to um, online in some ways a lot easier than what trial courts do. Um, on the right is a virtual staff meeting that I had with all of the folks who work in the administrative office of the courts um, just last week. And that those many different teams that are primarily working to support the trial courts throughout the state have been remarkably um, innovative and nimble in moving to online work and support. It's been one of the um, wonderful parts of what we've seen happen in the last few weeks. Slide, please. 
So just to give you a sense of how complicated the judiciary is in Michigan, um, there are 242 trial courts throughout the state that are funded by 165 different funding units. And as um, I'm sure you're aware, different funding units have different priorities for um, their local uh, courts and jurisdictions. Uh, that means there are different case management systems and computer systems throughout all of those courts of the state. And finally, just to make it a little more complicated, we have 83 separately elected county clerks who keep the records of all of those trial courts. So this is what you call a non-unified court system, which is complicated for um, the Michigan Supreme Court, which has, in addition to its decision-making function, we have by the constitution, the administrative function, the administrative oversight of the courts of the state. So it's our job to um, make sure that those 242 local trial courts throughout our very diverse state are all providing excellent service to the public. Um, but doing it in a non-unified system means um, it can be complicated and clunky. Slide, please. This is just to give you a sense of the annual caseloads to different courts here. Um, in the Supreme Court, we, bet we get about 2,000 um, requests for us to hear cases each year. Um, the, Court of the Court of Appeals decides between five and 6,000. The probate and circuit courts, um, 70,000 and 250,000, and the district courts of the state hear approximately 3 million cases a year. That's, when you think about that, in each of those 3 million cases, there is a litigant on each side of those disputes. Um, district courts, of course, are where our, our misdemeanor cases um, on the criminal side are heard, and our lower dollar um, civil cases are heard. But when I say lower dollar, they're, they're, those disputes are obviously still significant to the, to the people involved in them. And, and that's where I, I always um, caution people about how important it is that um, the courts are, that what the courts do and how they do it. When, when you have that many citizens every year interacting directly with their government, we really in the trial courts of this state are able to grow faith in government by how we treat people, by what we do and how we do it, or erode it uh, by how we do and what we do it. So it's a, I always say we're, we're, we are in the, uh, the business of adjudicating disputes, but we're also in the business of growing trust in government based on what we do and how we do it. Slide, please. So now I'm gonna turn a little bit to what, that, what all of this has looked like um, once we had to respond very quickly to the pandemic. And let me just set the stage a little. Um, I, just, I just showed you how many cases are heard in courts every year. And obviously they're different. Um, the numbers are different depending on the jurisdiction, but the courthouses in many communities are packed with people um, most days and packed with people who do not have a choice but to be there. So. Uh, your um, your favorite busy restaurant is one that you have a cho you have a choice to go to or not to go to, um, but your local courthouse uh, you are directed to be there, and we um, we have quite a lot of power to enforce our request that you be there if you decide not to. Um, so how we responded to this particular public health crisis was pretty important. We had to move quickly. Um, and figure out how to both make sure we could still continue to get the court's work done, courts cannot shut down, um, and also do so safely. Okay, slide please. So the first thing we did was we um, issued the mission, and by, when I say we, I mean my colleagues and I, the Michigan Supreme Court. Um, the Supreme Court issued um, a series of administrative orders targeted to slow the spread um, of the pandemic. We limited in-court, in-person work to essential and emergency functions. We set up a web page right away dedicated to the crisis. Um, we gave um, specific information to courts about essential functions and what those were. Um, and we right away stood up a virtual courtroom task force so that we could make sure we could give trial judges all the information possible for how to continue to doing, doing business, but doing it remotely. Slide, please. 
uh, my colleague David Viviano and I um, wrote an editorial for the Free Press um, that was published very early on, March 21st, explaining <clears throat> why it is that courts can't close. Courts have to function even in a pandemic. And you know, one of the points we, ma we made was perhaps especially in a pandemic, it is very important for um, our branch of government to continue to provide public services, the essential public services, even when they had to be in person, but safely, um, and to protect public safety while doing it. Slide, please. Um, so with this is how we, we defined and thought about um, essential court functions, um, protecting um, the vulnerable, um, hearings and arraignments for uh, criminal defendants, um, proceedings related to the public health crisis itself and other public health matters, those were obviously gonna have to be heard. Um, personal protection orders is kind of an important one. It, it, uh, we had reason to believe that domestic violence um, could be one of the areas where we might see an increase or an uptick in activity. Uh, and people need to be able to know that they can get protection from courts. Um, and finally, law enforcement needed to be able to rely on courts to continue to do the work that it does. And if those things couldn't be done remotely, we had to make sure they continued to be done in person. Slide, please. Um, at the same time, we were very well aware that jails in particular posed a particular um, threat given this, this public health crisis. Um, unlike prisons, uh, jail populations are a place where um, lots and lots of people cycle through, often for very short stays. In fact, uh, we know a whole lot about exactly who cycles through now that the jail task force has uh, spent the last 14 months looking for the first time at statewide data throughout Michigan about why our jail populations have swelled in the way that they have. Um, the, uh, this is, I will just, for, just to divert briefly, jail populations have grown uh, threefold in the last 30 years and crime is at a 50 year low. Uh, the jail and pretrial task force sought to figure out why that is um, and if in fact it was making our communities safer um, and as a, and a bipartisan and a unique group of people made a a set of recommendations to the legislature um, which i believe they're still working on um, even though uh, things have changed obviously uh, in the last six weeks um, but we knew based on our work that jails and especially their high population and high population turnover could cause a unique threat given this public health crisis. Um, and so we thought that was something we had to focus on. Slide please. Uh, the executive director of the Sheriff's Association um, and I, Matt Saxon and I issued a joint statement um, encouraging local sheriffs and chief judges to use all of the tools that they had available to them to make sure that their jail populations were um, reduced wherever they could be reduced safely. And they certainly um, answered the call. Uh, slide, please. Um, I should say before I move on to the, the Zoom hearings that we, the jail populations throughout the state, uh, my understanding is, are reduced anywhere from 25% to 75%. Um, and as a result, only five of 81 jails have had um, a, COVID, um, a COVID diagnosis. Um, and obviously, you know, what we were, we, I should have said this too, one of the concerns is not just for the people who are um, being, uh, the, the inmates, but the people who work there, uh, they don't, the, the sheriff and the deputy sheriffs who guard them, who keep them safe, don't have a choice to zoom into work. They have to go to work every day, and then they have to return home to their families and communities. Um, so whatever we could do to safely reduce jail populations, we, 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 we asked folks to do, uh, and they did. Um, here's what has had to happen in the trial courts. So you remember the numbers of how many cases our trial judges hear each year. They're, it's a lot. Um, but Michigan had a great advantage on many other states. I talked to chief justices in other states 
pretty regularly, including the ones uh, that are uh, close to Michigan. I talk to them once a week. Um, and we had a great jump on uh, just about every other state that I know of because um, the Michigan Supreme Court in our administrative oversight had outfitted each courtroom in the state with the hardware to do video hearings uh, a number of years ago, six or seven years ago. And we had bought them Zoom licenses uh, about 18 months ago. Um, and that's not because we saw a pandemic coming. Obviously, we did not. Um, I can't take any credit for that. But we did think that there were going to be efficiencies to using remote technology even without a public health crisis. So we thought it made sense to make sure that everybody had the tools to be able to figure out what they could do uh, using remote technology. And you'll see here um, Van Buren County uh, Chief Judge, Ka it's actually Kathleen Brickley, excuse my slide, um, presiding over a Zoom hearing. Um, and uh, uh, you might know Judge excuse me, moving my Elsenheimer, um, presiding over a Zoom hearing at home with his dog. Um, uh, many of the judges in the state are doing most of their dockets um, remotely, and the responses have been pretty positive. Slide, please. Um, this is just a, an overview of what's happened. We have a web page on the Michigan Supreme Court's website that um, will will um, allow anybody to see where virtual hearings are going on. Um, we, we, have, we have more than a thousand Zoom licenses for judges and other court officers throughout the state. Um, between April 1 and May 8th, there were more than 18,000 Zoom sessions for more than 90,000 hours of Zoom hearings. Uh, we've issued uh, virtual court, courtroom guidelines, standards. We have uh, Zoom bench cards. Um, we issued administrative orders to allow additional remote capacity to remove barriers so people could do as much as possible remotely. Um, and we are streaming, many of the courts throughout the state are streaming their proceedings live to YouTube. Slide, please. So if you go on to the Michigan Supreme Court's website and look at the Michigan Virtual Courtroom Directory, you can search by location or by judge. Um, I like to actually put in by location all courts. And then you can scroll through and see which courts are live now. So if on this particular slide, um, the, uh, the 90, I wish I could, I wish my eyes were not so good, 86 District Court has the um, streaming live now. You can click on that live now and watch what's happening um, in that courtroom from your living room or wherever it is you're watching. Um, this has, we have moved incredibly quickly to this uh, new, new way of doing business, and it's been um, one of the real upsides to see so many judges and lawyers, frankly, learn how to do business in a new way. Um, it's, it's funny because, it's not funny, but uh, one, the lawyers and law and judges are slow to adapt to change. There's, there's, I think there are lots of reasons for that. Some of them are good reasons. Um, we're, we, you know, we, we, we go to law school and learn to be risk adverse. You know, we didn't go to business school. We went to law school. We learned to uh, look out for risk. Uh, tradition plays an important role in, in what we do. Um, and so there are cultural and um, normative reasons why lawyers and courts have been slow to adapt to change. The, the tech revolution has not come for lawyers and law and courts the way it's come for other industries. And one of the um, most interesting sort of examples of that or evidence of that is we, we can, we still have, there are some photos that exist from 1918 um, during the Spanish flu pandemic of courts holding trials outside in, in open fields um, with people wearing masks. And, I, and it, it's, it, you know, it's amazing because every other industry, when you think of what it looked like in 1918, it looks really different today in 2020. Um, and yet courts don't look that different. Um, so, we, so we are, I think right now for the first time experiencing the biggest technical revolution we've seen um, in our industry, certainly um, in my lifetime, and I think a lot longer than that. Slide, please. Um, we also just last week, the Michigan Supreme Court um, issued an order 
um, requiring courts to submit their plans to us um, for approval as they reopen. We took a phased approach. We also issued uh, significant um, guidelines for how they do that. Um, we took a phased approach. We based it on guidance from the federal courts, the White House, the CDC, and the state health department. But what we did was we, we told chief judges that they had to base their reopening plans on the health data from their local health departments. So at least for our branch of government, it made sense for us to proceed, proceed in a local regional way. It's gonna make more sense for courts in some parts of the state to open up for in-person business, um, assuming they can do that safely, long before courts in say Detroit. Um, and not recognizing those reg regional differences didn't make, didn't make sense to us. So, we, so our guidance um, promotes local plans. Slide please. Um, we are at the same time continuing to work on what we can do remotely um, going forward. Um, not just because there are going to be some places where it's going to be a long time before courts can do business the way they used to, although that's true, um, but because it makes sense even without a public health crisis to think about how we can do business more efficiently and more effectively. So right now we have a remote jury trial pilot project um, going on. Uh, we've invited staff members, um, family members to participate um, as jurors. Uh, we have um, folks on our staff playing uh, witnesses and defendants. We have um, a trial judge from Macomb County presiding over the remote trial. Um, and then we have a group of um, 50 or 60 other uh, administrators and judges watching as this process unfolds to figure out what went well, what went less well. Um, are, there, are, there, are there improvements we could make in parts of it? Are there parts of it that just don't lend themselves to remote um, work? And on the other hand, parts that perhaps go even better with remote work. Um, and our goal is at the end of the pilot projects um, to be able to issue some best practices and help and support for courts who wanna, who wanna take, a, take a shot at it. Slide, please. Um, at the same time, we have found that there is a tremendous opportunity to improve access. Um, I said you might, you know, recall back to one of my early slides about the public being concerned about not being able to afford lawyers and therefore having a harder time having access to justice. Um, and technology is an is a a tremendous tool for increasing access to judge justice. Michigan already had, we already have a fantastic self-represented litigant website, michiganlegalhelp.org. I highly recommend it if you ever um, want to even just learn a little bit about a particular area that you think you might need legal help with. Um, and it's because it's a, an online tool, it's scalable to infinity. Um, but this uh, the, the transformation to remote work has opened up all kinds of possibilities for self-represented litigants. The, I will say that the visits to michiganlegalhelp.org have skyrocketed, um, most especially from people with interest in getting help with unemployment insurance, and Michigan Legal Help has tremendous um, information and resources on that and every other topic. Slide, please. So here's some of the lessons we've learned. Um, we're still learning. Uh, we actually have a task force right now focusing on lessons learned so we can make sure that we take with us all of the good. Um, virtual courtrooms are here to stay. There's gonna be work that judges are doing remotely forever. Um, and now that they've learned how, how to do them, uh, we're gonna figure out which, for, you know, for which cases, for which parts of cases, it makes sense to do them remotely. Um, Virtual courtrooms are going to be an answer to getting through the next few phases of this public health crisis in many parts of our state. And like I said before, um, different communities can make use of those resources more robustly when they need to and less robustly when that's okay as well. Um, in many cases, we're learning that virtual hearings are easier for litigants. Um, and in some of this, we didn't we didn't see exactly. So one example that we've heard from a number of 
judges who oversee proceedings with kids is that kids are surprisingly more talkative and open um, on a Zoom hearing than they are in a courtroom. I guess that maybe it shouldn't have surprised us. Courtrooms can be intimidating, maybe especially intimidating for children. Um, but but they're very comfortable talking into their phone, and we've we've heard over and over again from judges who've said, you know, this uh, this kid who I never could really get to open up uh, wanted to show me her room and then tell me about what she was learning, and um, it's it's providing opportunities that we didn't necessarily predict. Um, at the same time, it's also the case um, that judges have to know when there is private information or information um, about people who are vulnerable that we need to make sure we protect and we're thinking about all the ways to do that. Um, and what I'm most proud of is judges and court staff just showing how flexible and resilient they've been throughout this crisis um, to figure out how they can serve the public even when everything they were used to has changed. Slide please. That's it, that's all I prepared. I, as I said, I'm happy to answer as many questions as you have about any of these topics or any other topics, um, but thank you again for the invitation to address you. Yes, thank you. We definitely really, really do appreciate it. And we did have a few questions that came in. Um, so I am gonna start with the first one here. Coming out of the COVID pandemic and given these best practices you've learned, where do we go from here? And what is your personal hope for Michigan's courts? Yeah, that's a wonderful question. And one that I wanna say my first answer is, I want us to keep answering it because today's answer um, might be an excellent answer for today based on what we've learned so far, but I promise you a week from now, we will have learned even more. Um, and I will say the, 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 the it is, absolutely the case that we are going to be doing business differently in Michigan's courts. Um, there will always be work that has to be done in a physical courtroom um, with the presence of the parties, the litigants, um, and a judge. But there is an awful lot we can do differently. Um, there are ways people can resolve their disputes using technology, using alternative dispute resolution processes, that lead to more satisfied um, customers. And by customers, I mean the public, the people who use our courts. And if we've learned anything, it's that um, it's time for us to focus all of our work on what the public wants. Um, there's this famous story that, um, now I can't think of his name. He's like a British academic who writes about courts, but he's, he tells the story about Black and Decker having a company meeting about a new drill and, and talking to the salespeople about the drill and 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 asking uh, the the salespeople what it is you know what it is we're selling and they said you know a fancy new drill and and, and the answer was like no it's not we're selling holes you know what the customers want are holes we're selling holes not drills um, and we have to make sure in our courts we use all of the tools we have to deliver what it is that the public wants, right? And the public wants to be able to adjudicate, people don't wanna to come to court. I mean, coming to court is not like something people look forward to. So they wanna be able to take care of the business they have to take care of using courts efficiently, effectively, um, and in ways they can understand on their own if they um, choose not to hire a lawyer. So keeping the public at the center of everything we do is the most important thing that we will come through this with. Yeah, that's that's great. Um, the the next question we had is um, so our organization represents the biz the business community. What is something you want to make sure our businesses know about Michigan courts? That is a great question. Um, I I I want our business community to know that Michigan courts are um, are are like the founders imagined, um, different from the other branches of government. And that is a place where um, you can count on independent decisions based on the law. Um, you know, a business owner needs to be able to plan for next year and five years from now and 10 years from now. And 
um, you need to therefore be able to rely on courts um, not to change with the partisan winds. Uh, that's really important. And that's one of the foundational principles that guides the judiciary. Um, and I want, I want you to know that you can count on that. Great. Um, the next question we have is, given that the courts have not stopped working and remain open and operational, virtually and for emergencies, is there any insight to lawyers or the, or the public to access the lawyers or legal rep representation as to how to work when none of the executive orders recognize lawyers or those in the legal profession or industry as essential workers? Yeah, so I've had this question actually from a few individual lawyers, and but but not a lot. Um, and I think the reason is because um, the executive order leaves a lot of room for lawyers to continue to work. Um, don't I'm not you know I don't I'm not right now interpreting in, not in my official capacity interpreting any orders because someday I might have to do that, and I, 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 I'm not doing that right now. But it, but the executive order. Um, Clearly, the executive orders, I should say, clearly don't want folks going to their offices and working as usual. They want you doing that work wherever possible from home and remotely, and most lawyers um, have no problem doing that. But not always. And when there are um, reasons why a lawyer has to get a file from his or her office, um, communicate with a client who doesn't have the tools to, um, to, to be able to communicate with his or her lawyer remotely. Uh, the executive order, um, it orders leave, leave plenty of room for that. Um, for example, the executive order obviously exempts people who have to do business in court. Um, so uh, I think that there is room for lawyers to represent clients and frankly, they have to represent their clients given the code of professional conduct um, consistently with the executive order, just not in offices the way they used to. Great. Um, the next question is, generally speaking, how backlogged are the various circuit courts? How long do you anticipate it taking to get caught up? So that's a great question, and the answer is it really varies based on how quickly and effectively each judge has transitioned to remote work. So in one of the slides, there was a photo of Kathy Brickley, who's the chief judge of Van Buren County. I talked to Kathy last week and she was 100% current on her docket. She had literally done all of her docket. So she's not behind at all. So if you live in Van Buren County, you're not gonna have any backlog. There are other counties where it has taken a little longer for um, judges to, 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 to move their work to online, not always because it's the judge's fault, sometimes um, because the judiciary is complicated and uh, we rely on separately elected county clerks or county employees who are running the buildings. There are sometimes other complications that have made it more difficult for judges to transform their work to online work. But we're hoping that with the tools, the software and the hardware that they all have, the backlog can, um, does not have to be uh, overwhelming anywhere, frankly. And the Michigan Supreme Court is determined to support um, uh, and help judges throughout the state to make sure that's the case. I, have, uh, I do have concerns about the, 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 there will be new cases post COVID, post pandemic, especially debt collection actions that have the uh, that I'm that I'm concerned could overwhelm our courts maybe our district courts even more than our circuit courts um, and we're trying to give some thoughtful um, consideration to whether there are ways we can address some of those what we expect to see um, rising debt collection actions so this might be a good follow-up question to that. And it's, do you foresee courts continuing to use the platforms such as Zoom, even after the pandemic is, is over or somewhat cleared up where we can go back to this new normal? Absolutely, the answer is absolutely yes. Um, I hate to keep going back to Van Buren County, but uh, Judge Brickley said she, she can't imagine going back to doing business the old way because the lawyers and the litigants 
so much prefer being able to do many of the routine hearings by Zoom um, so they don't have to take the time to drive to the courthouse. Um, litigants who didn't, you know, who didn't want to have to take a day off from work could step out of work for a short break when a hearing was going to be short enough and not miss a day of work, not have to find childcare. Um, so the, the, the benefits of giving everybody the tools to work remotely are certainly going to, going to, going to stay with us, no doubt about it. Yeah, I think that'll probably be the case, you know, across the board, I'm sure for many. Um, but aside from the virtual platforms, is there anything else that you feel will become the new normal that will get adopted and kind of picked up along with, um, obviously, these virtual platforms such as Zoom? I do think we're going to see a, 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 an increase in people's interest in using alternative dispute resolution forums that we make available. So I didn't, I didn't do a slide on this, but could have. Um, we have also opened up online dispute resolution. Um, we had it in, we had it up and running in 17 counties, and now we're bringing two additional counties on every week. And it's a platform where people can mediate their disputes, but they can do it at any time. It's a, you know, um, you don't have to sign on at a particular time. You can sign on on Friday night or Saturday morning from your smartphone to see what the offer is or what the, you know, what the, what, or if you want to have a mediation through the dispute, dis, uh, community dispute resolution center, you can do that. If you just want to um, send offers back and forth, you can do that. But I think we're going to see a real increase in people's interest in um, technological platforms that offer alternative ways to resolve disputes um, that the court can make available. Yeah, so this is a, a really great um, follow up question to that as well, because although technology is so great and you know can be adapted so much widely now, this question said, given that many district courts disputes deals with people on more of a limited income and no longer have access to community centers like libraries, how are courts overcoming the hurdle or barrier of technology accesses? Yeah, so making sure that um, people who have the least means are not excluded from this, you know, maybe tech revolution in our courts is something we're incredibly mindful of. Um, but I will say that we had already viewed technology as perhaps an answer to some of that. So, um, but, it, but, but it, it, it's absolutely the case in places where there is uh, it, it, imperfect broadband or for people who simply just don't have access to the tools that we're going to have to figure out what it is that is needed to make sure um, they're not excluded from the different offerings that courts can make available. Um, and it's, it, it, the, the pandemic complicates that because libraries, frankly, were, in my view, one of the big, um, one of the great answers to that. You know, li libraries can be, uh, access to justice hubs. There is no reason why uh, we couldn't have in libraries throughout our state um, self-help um, centers where people could access the legal information and forms and um, even get help with some of those. Um, some of what, uh, you know, some of what we're gonna have to think about is how we can make sure that people besides lawyers can help people with the tools that are available and where they can use those tools if they can't access them from their homes. So I think this is one place where um, the community's reopening is going to be pretty important because uh, libraries and community centers are places where I believe we can bring the technology to folks who can't get it at home. Yeah, that's a, that's a really great point. Um, someone just wanted to verify the legal help website is michiganlegalhelp.org, correct? It, yeah, it's milegalhelp.org. Milegalhelp.org, got it, okay. All right, well, I don't see any additional questions coming in at this time, um, but the ones that were asked were, were great. And we just cannot thank you enough, you know, from Travers Connect and the Northern Michigan Chamber Alliance, thank you so much for your time today, for all of your insight. It was so valuable and we, we really appreciate it. Thank you for having me, and I, I, I'm happy to come back anytime anybody has any questions. Thanks so much. Perfect. Thank you. I hope everyone has a great day. Stay safe, stay healthy, and we hope to see you at our next webinar.
Thanks, Thank everyone. You.